Well, hello everyone. I'm Cindy Small with the Gettysburg Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the opening program of the 11th annual Sacred Trust Talks and Book Signing event. The Gettysburg Foundation and Gettysburg National Military Park are pleased to present this popular event each year. Tomorrow and Sunday, you are invited to join us for the second part of Sacred Trust, our traditional talks and book signings format that features a lineup of seven impressive speakers each day, a consecutive string of renowned Civil War historians, authors, and National Park Service interpretive rangers. Our panel discussion this evening is an exciting new format to kick off our Sacred Trust event. To begin, I'd like to tell you of our moderator who will introduce our panel. Our moderator this evening is Gettysburg National Military Park's historian of the Division of Interpretation, John Heiser. Mr. Heiser is well equipped for the panel's discussion topic as he has spent over a decade dedicated to the stories of veterans. John Heiser began his National Park Service career in 1976 as a seasonal employee at Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park in Virginia, before moving here to Gettysburg National Military Park in 1980. In 1997, he transferred into the historian's position with the Division of Interpretation and Visitor Services, where he maintains the park website, coordinates library services, assists researchers and provides ranger-guided battlefield programs, and special Battle of Gettysburg anniversary programs for visiting organizations, for Civil War roundtables, and for park visitors. Please join me in welcoming tonight's moderator, John Heiser. Thank you, Cindy, and uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Gettysburg National Military Park. It's great to see so many faces out there tonight. We are very fortunate to have a group of uh, teachers, historians, and people who are so knowledgeable about the Civil War here on our panel discussion tonight. I think you're really in for a treat. I'd like to start by introducing uh, the gentleman on the far left, Dr. James Martin. He's professor and chair of Marquette University History's, uh, Marquette University's History Department, past president of the Society of Civil War Historians. He's written or edited over a dozen books on the Civil War, including the Children's Civil War, which won the Alpha Sigma Nu Jesuit National Book Award for History in 1999. He was named an outstanding and academic book by Choice Magazine, and Dr. Martin was appointed to the Organization of American Historians Distinguished Lectureship Program in 2004. Next to him, Dr. Keith Harris, graduated summa cum laude from the University of California, Los Angeles, received his PhD at the University of Virginia, where he specialized in 19th century American history with a special emphasis on the Civil War, Reconstruction, the Era of Reconciliation. His first book, Across the Bloody Chasm, The Culture of Commemoration Among Civil War Veterans, is available from Louisiana State University Press. Dr. Harris has written several articles and essays as a creator and host of KeithHarrisHistory.com and the editor of the Americanist Independent, a web-based quarterly journal of United States history. He is currently writing a book on the making of the controversial, very controversial silent film, The Birth of a Nation. And next to him, Mr. Christopher Gwynn, Supervisory Park Ranger here at Gettysburg National Military Park. Chris is a seven-year veteran of the National Park Service, graduated from Gettysburg College in 2006, received his master's degree in public history in 2008. He has worked as a park ranger at Antietam National Battlefield, Boston National Historic Park, the National Mall in Washington, D.C., recreated some of the first interpretive programming conducted at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. He's currently the supervisory ranger for interpretation education here at Gettysburg National Military Park. And last but not least is Dr. Timothy Orr, graduate of Gettysburg College also, earned his Ph.D. in history from the Pennsylvania State University. Before pursuing his career at Old Dominion University, he was a park ranger here at Gettysburg, a national military park. He's now assistant professor of history at Old Dominion University, where he specializes in American history and the history of the Civil War era. Dr. Orr teaches courses on American military history, American naval history, Virginia history, and the history of the Civil War and Reconstruction. His latest book entitled, Last to Leave the Field, The Life and Letters of First Sergeant Ambrose Henry Wayward, Company D, 28th, was published in 2010. 
and Dr. Orr is credited with writing several book chapters on related topics. Gentlemen, welcome to our panel tonight, and thank you so much for coming. One of the subjects I thought would be very interesting to us to open uh, the Sacred Trust would be about memory in the Civil War, Civil War and remembrance, and how we remember it today. And how did the veterans of that war influence our thinking, our understanding of not just battles and campaigns, but of the causes and the effects of the American Civil War? So the basic question to our panel tonight is, was the story of the causes of the Civil War and its result lost by the veterans as they told and retold the story of the war into their later years? I'm going to give the panelists five minutes to discuss. Uh, they each have a presentation, about five or so minutes. And after that, we'll open up to further discussion. Let's start with Dr. Martin. Oh, you can do it right there. Okay. Hopefully that mic's working. I think it's working cool. It's working big time. Um, well, thanks for coming, everyone. I'm going to take a somewhat different take, I think, than, than some might. I'm going to talk about one veteran and how he told his story, because he had a very particular story. Uh, I recently wrote a book about this guy. He's James Tanner, the most famous person we've never heard of. Uh, if you had asked in 1890, how's the corporal doing, Every, everyone would know how he was doing. Uh, he was a very famous speaker in GAR. He's uh, commander of the chief of the GAR in 1905. Uh, he uh, had been pension commissioner for an ill-fated eight months in 1989. Uh, he was a really famous guy, and no one's ever heard of him. Uh, one reason he was famous is that as an 18-year-old uh, serving in the worst regiment in the Army of the Potomac, I think, the 87th of New York, uh, which dissolved before the second Manassas, he lost the lo lower thirds of both legs uh, with a, one piece of shrapnel ripped through both of them. Uh, and by the time he became an adult and moved to Brooklyn. He, he, he had political offices all the way through the rest of his life, uh, for the most part, uh, along with being again, a Republican operative. Um, he made a living telling his story. Uh, he was a headliner on Chautauqua tours in the 1880s and 90s, between the Lyceums and, and everywhere around the country. He gave GAR speeches every Memorial Day and probably 23 to other times and during the course of the year. He gave thousands of speeches. And one of his most famous is one called Soldier Life, the Grave and the Gay. Uh, it's not, well, you're probably not thinking that. Anyway, it's, it's, it sounds funny to our ears these days, but, but uh, it was about the serious and, 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 the, and the funny parts of being a soldier. Uh, and part of it was losing his legs. Uh, that was the last third of the lecture always. But he, he had this very particular talk that he gave for years that had not only his experiences, but a, but a, a lot of kind of generic experiences chaplains who swore, army mules that were stubborn. Um, uh, think that he had not, he, I don't believe he ever fired a shot in anger. Um, he was, a, again, a very bad regiment he was in, uh, and it was absorbed by a different one after the Battle of uh, Second Manassas. But he became famous given gi giving this lecture. So one of his purposes in this lecture, and one way he told his story, uh, was to humanize soldiers. Uh, throughout his life, he's one of the biggest advocates for pension expansion. So one reason he did this was to make soldiers seem like normal guys um, uh, and, and, and to encourage the civilians to support bigger pensions for them. Um, in terms of his personal experience with losing, again, the lower third of his legs, he's, he's famous. He shows up in the 11 volume or 7 volume you know, history of the medical history of the, of the war uh, as one of seven people to survive the particular thing he experienced. Uh, he's, he's, he's a footnote you know, uh, in, in, this, in this volume. But he told jokes about it mainly. I mean, one way he remembered his own experience as a, as a grievously wounded soldier uh, who nearly died uh, from his wounds was to make jokes. Uh, my favorite is uh, he, he would tell the story about uh, apparently he had racehorses and he was washing one and it was really hot water. And uh, a guy passing by said, you, that's too hot water. The horse can't stand that. Uh, and oh, he's fine, uh, Tanner said. And the guy said, I bet you can't put your feet in that hot water, and hold for five minutes. Tanner said, I bet I can. And he won $20. He never told the guy you know, that he had done this. <laughs> and there's a couple other jokes that he tells. He's very lighthearted. He has several surgeries over the course of all his adult life. Uh, they never heal, really. Uh, and it's covered in all the newspapers. Uh, whenever the Brooklyn Eagle, for instance, other people follow these surgeries that he has when they shorten the legs a couple more times. Uh, and he makes jokes about them. But the one time he didn't make a joke, and it was fairly early on, he told one reporter, you know, there's all these train accidents lately, you know, and the trains would, 
would run off the tracks, fires would break out because they were open you know, the stoves, you know, on, on the passenger cars. And, he, and, and people would die of fire. And he said, you know, I can't jump an inch. And so if I'm ever in a train wreck, I always carry a pistol under my pill pillow. I'm not dying in a fire. It's the only serious thing he ever said about being disabled. And that's, a, again, kind of an unusual way of remembering, I think, and, and getting at that. But the most important time he remembered and told, remembered his own history and told the story was for a much bigger purpose. Uh, he was a, a charter member of the uh, Red Cross uh, board when it was reorganized about 1900. Theodore Roosevelt appointed him to the board. Uh, his wife had actually worked with Clara Barton and other things before this. Uh, and in 1916, he published a two, uh, two article series in the American Red Cross magazine uh, called um, Before Red Cross Days. And there's a subtitle about second, the Battle of Second Manassas and, 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 and my, the end of my war. And he described in extraordinarily gruesome detail uh, his wounding, his treatment. He's lying in a wood floored canvas tent uh, uh, in sort of a makeshift hospital controlled by the Confederates for 10 days with three other guys that had lost at least one limb. I think he said they'd lost seven limbs between them, the six of them in, in, that, in that tent. No treatment except for a drunken Yankee. The only thing he did was a doctor who stepped on his stump one day. Um, they're finally exchanged. Uh, he goes to the Fairfax Seminary Hospital where he's treated for about three months, I think. What almost kills him is bed sores in his back, which they treat with hydrochloric acid, which they inject into his back while he's awake. And he describes all of this. Now, here's why he does this. Uh, and, and why I think it's an important way remembering, and, and a unique way uh, of remembering the war. He, he warns that, you know, we have another war coming. And he's very much in favor of the United States intervening in the war. And he, reporters always asked him his opinion about stuff because he was a good copy, you know. Uh, but we need to have a medical corps who's also prepared. And so it's a different kind of use of memory. And he certainly isn't hiding the gruesomeness of war. He always talks about these things. Not, I don't think he talks about the back thing, which is the worst part of it, in the grave and the gay. You know, he just talks about the leg and, and things like that. But, but in this, you know, 40, 50 years later almost, um, he, over I guess, um, he, he writes about his experience as a way of preventing future veterans from having that experience. And that really is the purpose and it's framed that way by the editor of the magazine. Uh, and so in some ways he does share a number of really um, almost stereotypes of the typical telling of stories. He's very reconciliationist in his public speeches. He virtually ignores race. Um, uh, he, he, he's the type of guy you're not talking about in your book, you know, because he's very much um, mainstream uh, in, in how he thinks about these things. But he had very specific purposes in telling his stories, I think, to make veterans seem deserving of, petter, of, vet, of, 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 of pensions and to prepare uh, future, the future needs of wounded soldiers and to make money. That's also an unusual thing for a veteran, you know. And he's, he makes tons and tons of money, $100 a lecture. Uh, that's a lot of money then, plus expenses. Uh, and so uh, that in itself makes it kind of an odd example, I think. But that's, that's the guy I've got. That's great. Thank you. Uh, let's go on to Dr. Harris. Thank you. Now, I'm going to be completely different and stand behind the lectern. Just because I like to move around a lot. <laughs> and that, that chair, I can't be contained by that chair. <laughs> that's not going to work for me. Greetings, everybody, and thanks so much for coming uh, tonight. Speaking generally about veterans, when we speak about Civil War veterans and their commemorative efforts in the latter third of the 19th century and the, the early part of the 20th century, the conversation almost always turns to the notion of reconciliation. Now this word reconciliation at first seems simple enough. To us it means general forgiveness. It's a, it's a figurative or even a literal clasping of the hands between former enemies who put the past behind them in an effort to get on with life in a reunified nation. And I've got some, we've got some pretty good evidence to suggest this actually happened. I'm sure you're all quite familiar with the powerful images that are taken not very far from this exact spot. During the 15th, or the 50th rather, uh, anniversary commemoration of the Battle of Gettysburg in 1913, where thousands of blue and gray clad veterans came together in a spirit of mutual commemoration, free from all the issues of war. And what we see at this event is reconciliation at work. But in reality, in reality, events such as the 1913 reunion were extraordinarily rare 
More often than not, veterans gathered together along sectional lines. And as you might guess, they, what they had to say at such gatherings was exceedingly sectional in tone. Their words reflected their respective causes. Now, while it's true that they overwhelmingly endorsed reconciliation, they did so on clearly sectional terms. And here's the donut. Veterans were perfectly happy to reach across the bloody chasm, as it were, to embrace their former enemies so long as these enemies admitted that there was only one cause worth celebrating. Guess what? That hardly ever happened. And what really did happen was precisely the opposite. Veterans worked tirelessly to preserve sectional memories that advanced one side over the other, and in so doing, they conjured fear, anger, and resentment among formerly warring parties. So we're left with a rather troubling question. How could veterans' memories at once promote reconciliation and simultaneously serve to widen the chasm between sections? The answer is, of course, more complicated than many of us realize. But I think we can figure out how seemingly conflicting ideals actually make sense together by looking at, on one hand, the veterans' imagined past, which is their perception of intentions of the founding generation, including nostalgia for a shared national identity. And on the other hand, sorry, this is, and on the other hand, the vivid memories of their lived past, when countrymen had tried really, really hard to kill each other. Reconciliation among these killers, in my estimation, rests with the imagined past. The past where conflicting interests came together under one constitution, guided by the founder's wisdom. Veterans were reconciled, if you will, to the abstract notion of America, of a singular national identity. In his first inaugural, Abraham Lincoln called such reconciliation, or excuse me, such recollection, the mystic chords of memory. In this much, at least, a shared heritage, including shared traits and virtues, and shared national heroes and galvanizing events, this was an easy pill for Civil War veterans to swallow. But the blue-gray love fest ended there. Veterans from each side commemorated their war as if their former opponents had gone astray and perverted the intentions of the founders. Though they talked a big talk about post-war unity and they often styled themselves reconciled, veterans recalled their former enemies as base perpetrators of lies who carried with them the spirit of a treasonous slaveocracy or the spoils of tyranny. And something else is worth mentioning today, I think, particularly as we continue today to argue over the meaning of the war, and you'll see that, you see it everywhere in the press. Veteran sentiments remained remarkably consistent over time. Their devotion to issues and memories of the war years appear as sharp in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as they did in 1865. They use precisely the same language and express the same views late in life as they had as young men. Now, all of this means that the conventional wisdom that veterans' memories faded over time and that they eventually let things go, well, this simply is just not correct. One need only look at the speeches, the publications, the organization's uh, notes and memoirs to see that their respective causes remained extraordinarily vibrant. What's more, veterans uh, understood that as time passed and their numbers dwindled, the memories of their respective causes faced the danger of disappearing or being rewritten. In fact, they feared that those born after the Civil War generation would forget their sacrifices. As, the, as such, they redoubled their efforts late in life to ensure that their arguments did not fade. School children and various sons and daughters groups became the focal point for memory and preservation. And veterans on each side worked to underscore both the right and the wrong, according to them, versions of Civil War history. Now, considering that on this very day, the news is full of contention over the meaning of the war and its symbols. Maybe their concerns were valid. But I'll leave it to you during the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Next is Mr. Chris Gwynn, Supervisor Park Ranger here at Gettysburg. Chris? Can you hear me with the mic here? I'm, I'm hesitant to move it after the last one. I'm probably about as eager to sit as Dr. Harris is to stand. I'm going to hike around the battlefield for three days. Uh, I, I want to start off actually talking about Facebook. Uh, the National Park here at Gettysburg, we have a Facebook page. We're usually about five years behind technology-wise, the government, uh, but we do have a Facebook page. And during the anniversary of uh, the 150th, 150th, a couple years ago, 
We had our Facebook page, and over the course of four days, June 30th to July 4th, we pumped out all kinds of videos, images, collages, we put a lot of material out there, and, and the public just ate it up. And over the course of those four days, we had a, a reach of just under a million people, and, and a reach is a, a Facebook's way, it's kind of its analytic of telling you how many people saw that, how many you know, images of Gettysburg showed up on individual people's computers, so just under a million, which is really, really good. Um, given the recent controversy surrounding the Confederate flag and how it's used at Gettysburg National Military Park and elsewhere, the director of the Park Service, John Jarvis, asked the individual parks to go to their bookstores, their cooperating bookstores, and pull certain items that had the Confederate flag on it. Certain standalone items is what we were told. So like a Confederate flag shot glass or a Confederate flag beach towel. So that's what we did. And on our Facebook page, we published a, um, a statement trying to tell folks, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the page just blew up. There was hundreds upon hundreds of comments, you, a lot of misinformation. Some folks thought we're going out in the battlefield, we're tearing down the statue of Robert E. Lee, we're smelting James Longstreet's likeness to make a, you know, make a statue of Abraham Lincoln out of it, all kinds of crazy stuff. And we're not going to allow living historians to carry the flag on the battlefield, all kinds of stuff. None of it was true. And so the next day we decided, well, we'll try to correct some of these, these misconceptions. And so I, I was told to go into the, the museum with a camera and take a photograph of some of the, the Confederate flags that are still on display in the museum that were carried during the Battle of Gettysburg that are artifacts that we use to educate people, to educate folks, part of the story of the battle. So that's what I did. And then I posted it. That one post that I posted on one day reached four million people, which I think is a, one, an indication of the, the much larger conversation we're having right now as a nation over the, the Confederate battle flag and Confederate uh, imagery and symbols. I think it's an indication of how strong people feel about that flag. And I also have the responsibility of going through and kind of reading some of the comments, some of the very vitriolic statements and uh, some really, really profound conversations took place. And from reading those conversations, I walked away with a couple things. Uh, one, people view that flag in many different ways. Some people see that flag as a symbol of, of their heritage, and I don't think they're wrong. Some people see that flag as a kind of a relic of, of history 150 years ago, this kind of antiquated symbol that we, you know, isn't really relevant to, uh, to us today. Uh, some people see that as a, a symbol of hate. Some people see that as a symbol of of racially based oppression and violence. And none of these people are wrong, they're all right. And I think maybe the biggest issue we're having as far as that, that flag is concerned is, is our inability to look at the flag from the perspective of people whose opinions on it run, run counter to ours. But, um, but that's nothing new, that's nothing new. This battlefield park has always been grappling with how to deal with the Confederate battle flag, with Confederate imagery with Confederate monuments and memorials. And today we're talking about how veterans told the story of their war, and they told it through many different mediums. I think perhaps a more important question or a bigger question is to talk about why the veterans told their story. And um, I think part of it is because they were concerned about how they would be remembered, how we would remember them today, how their grandkids would remember them, how their children would remember what they did in this battlefield. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll state with a fair degree of confidence that I think there's no more significant way, method, medium, uh, and I think the veterans realize this, there's no more significant thing which dictates how we today view, view these men who fought 152 years ago than the landscapes where they fought, the battlefields, in particular battlefield parks like Gettysburg, uh, like Gettysburg National Military Park. And the veterans who initially created the park grappled with the same questions that we're dealing with today. How best to incorporate the Confederate side of the story? How best to show Confederate imagery and Confederate symbols? Um, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions about, about Union and Confederate veterans and how they engaged each other on this battlefield in the post-war years, some of which Dr. Harris very eloquently talked about. Uh, we have a very reconciliationist view, again, as Dr. Harris mentioned. We have that, that image of these guys shaking hands across the wall, kind of burned into our brain. And of course, it's much more complex than that. Uh, maybe my favorite story of any reunion, blue and gray reunion that takes place at Gettysburg, occurs in 1913 during the Great Peace Jubilee. Thousands of veterans descend on the battlefield. Uh, there's this massive encampment. 
And for the most part, the images that came out of that were those you know, happy-go-lucky veterans clutching their, their respective flags, embracing in comradeship. Uh, but if you ever have the opportunity to take a look at the Gettysburg Compiler, the Gettysburg newspaper, look at the July 3rd and July 4th issue in 1913. And one of the stories that uh, is featured is the, uh, the account of a stabbing that occurred. And it happened in the, uh, the dining room of the Gettysburg Hotel. The Gettysburg Hotel is packed with people, uh, veterans, veterans' kids, family members, this carnivalesque atmosphere. And apparently there were a whole bunch of veterans sitting down at a table talking uh, with one another. And there was the son of a Confederate veteran there. And somehow the conversation got turned to Abraham Lincoln. And uh, the, um, the Confederate veteran's son apparently made some sort of disparaging remark about Lincoln. And one of the Union veterans was present, obviously took umbrage at this, and according to the newspaper account, he picked up a bottle or a glass and hurled it at the guy. And this just exploded, it escalated very, very quickly. This, um, this uh, son of a Confederate veteran pulls out a knife, upturns the table, and he just starts stabbing people. And before the, uh, the situation is under control, eight people were stabbed including a, a Pennsylvania state trooper. Ironically, none of the people stabbed was the one that threw the bottle at him, which I <laughs> kind of remarkable. Um, but there's always been, I think, this underlying tension between Union and Confederate veterans on the battlefield. And I think perhaps a better example of that is an event that occurs in 1903. In 1903, and by this point in time, the battlefield park is, is run by the federal government, it's run by the War Department, and the battlefield looks to a certain extent, how we see it today. The park avenues have been laid out. Uh, the War Department tablets are on the battlefield. In 1903, the state of Pennsylvania appropriates $20,000 to erect a statue on the Gettysburg battlefield to Robert E. Lee, um, which is kind of surprising, right? The state of Pennsylvania is going to do this. It's only 40 years after the, after the Civil War. Um, th their reasoning for doing that, one, it had to be matched by the state of Virginia. So Virginia had to put in $20,000 for this as well. But the, uh, the, um, the reason they said that they wanted to do it was, one, as an act of history. Uh, as one man who was a real proponent of the statue described, Gettysburg is a beautiful one-sided story, and there's nothing on the battlefield to tell visitors that there was an army equal to our own and that it was defeated on this battlefield. And that Lee statue would apparently fix that. The other was an act of reconciliation, the, the bringing together of the two you know, fractured halves of the country, the two... Uh, veterans of the opposing armies, and this statue to Lee wasn't going to be a, a tribute to Lee. It was going to be a tribute to the heroism of, of both the blue and the gray. It wasn't going to be a tribute to the rebellion, just the contrary. As you can imagine, uh, Union veterans freaked out about this. They freaked out. That's the only word to describe it. In part because at that point in time, a lot of Union veterans looked at the Gettysburg battlefield as a Union memorial park. This battlefield existed to tell you and other generations of the valor, the sacrifice of Union soldiers who fought and died in this battlefield in July of 1863. And they were very reticent to see any kind of glorification of the rebellion, of the Confederate Army, or of Robert E. Lee on this battlefield. And when the news of this proposed statue to Robert E. Lee kind of hits the streets, as I mentioned, the veterans are incredibly, incredibly upset at that. Uh, one, they don't see how it could possibly be an act of reconciliation. David McMurdy Gregg said if that was the intention, it would surely fan into a flame the, uh, the, the, the discord rather than have any kind of reconciliatory effect. Another uh, GAR post up in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania said that if the state of Pennsylvania is so eager to spend money, it would be better spent giving the money to the families who suffered losses during the Pennsylvania campaign as Robert E. Lee and his men are marching north. Uh, but also, it, it wasn't really an act of history either. Uh, one uh, Union veteran from Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, a man by the name of John Stewart, said, if you want that statue of Lee to be an act of history, it should be Lee carrying a Confederate flag with the uh, legend, uh, here we fought. Oh, let me, let me, actually, I don't want to mess up the quote, so I'll read it exactly. Um, the Lee Monument, he said, um, no, I'm, no, I'm losing it. Anyways. Make a long story short, it should talk about how the fact that Lee came into Pennsylvania to try to overthrow the government, uh, to try to, to overthrow a country dedicated to liberty and humanity. And um, Union veterans were, were really upset about the idea that, that this statue to Robert E. Lee is going to be placed on the Gettysburg battlefield. 
To make a very long story short, the monument is never erected. So vocal was the outcry on behalf of the Union veterans. Now eventually, the state of Virginia in 1917 would erect the Virginia Memorial. And originally, they were intending to include the Confederate flag on the Virginia Memorial itself. And even then, that was controversial. Ultimately, it was replaced with the Virginia state flag. The reason I mention that is the veterans, I think, understood really well that, that this battlefield was going to play a huge role in shaping how we remembered them today. And I think they were right. And they guarded that memory. And they guarded this place very, very jealously. So when we talk about this debate with the Confederate battle flag, when we talk about how we use it today in 2015 and, and how it should be displayed on the battlefield, I think it's really important to remember, this is not a new conversation. This is a conversation that goes all the way back to the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. And the veterans knew that, that what they did on this battlefield, the monuments, the markers, the reunions, the gatherings, these were going to have an incredibly long shelf life. And I think they're right. Hey, thank you, Chris. Tim, you can come up here. All right. I've always been, uh, by nature, a stander uh, when presenting, and since the precedent has been set, I will, uh, I will adhere to that. Um, I should say, uh, right off the bat, I'm feeling a bit under the weather, so I'm going to be more attached to my notes than I ought to be. Uh, but I'd like to begin by offering up a question. Uh, a question that I often ponder, uh, and that is, if we had, say, 100 Civil War veterans in the audience tonight, about as many as are uh, in our audience, um, and we gave them each uh, a brush and some paint, we told them to cover this entire wall behind me, told them to paint the Civil War, what kind of image would they paint? And I am very flummoxed as to come up with a definable answer. And to explain of what I mean, I would like to give you two stories of memoirists from the Union Army who wrote about their war stories after the war. And if we tell these two stories, they paint two contrasting pictures, pictures that complicate the war's remembrance and make it very difficult in the lives of historians today who study Civil War veterans. Uh, the first is Corporal George Kimball, who enlisted in the 12th Massachusetts in June 1861, fought with his regiment and many of the famous engagements of the Army of the Potomac, including Antietam, Gettysburg, the Overland Campaign, and the Siege of Petersburg. He survived two grisly wounds and mustered out in July of 1864. As a veteran, he became a prolific writer of war stories and a frequent attender of his regiment's annual reunions. From 1883 to 1885, he published his most famous work, Short Recollections of His Army Service, in an independent journal that is now forgotten called The Bivouac. Now, unlike many memoirists, Kimball's tales were not overly muddled with tactical minutia. Instead, he preferred to describe the Civil War's intensely human moments, giving a readers a taste of the war's dizzying highs and its disheartening lows. And one story that always catches my attention when I read it uh, is Kimball's tale of the Union retreat from the Battle of Mine Run. On a blustery night, December 1, 1863, Kimball's regiment lost an enlisted man, Private William F. Emerson. Emerson was a spare man, probably very similar in build to me, uh, and he had a very active stomach, a lot like me. As a rule, he grew famished with surprising suddenness and intensity. And on this particular night, as Kimball described him, he was wild with hunger and moaned piteously over his hard fate. Even more frustrating, Emerson had recently acquired a pint of raw beans, but because the Union Army undertook a stop-and-go march, he had no opportunity to cook them. Every time the regiment halted, Emerson immediately went to work lighting a fire, only to have his cooking interrupted by the officers. Finally, at one stop, which was longer than the others, Emerson got a decent fire going, and his beans began to crack open. The inevitable order came to fall in, but Emerson refused to budge. He intended to sit and eat his beans, no matter what the rest of the army did. Sternly, his lieutenant reminded him of the proximity of the Confederates, while his comrades kindly entreated him to shoulder his rifle and join the column. But Emerson would hear none of it. Kimball related, hunger had made him desperate. He turned a deaf ear to everything and everybody, exclaiming in a tone which showed that reason no longer held sway over his mind, I will eat them now if I have to eat them in hell. Uh, 
With that, the column trudged on, leaving Emerson hunched over his fire like a gargoyle. Slowly but surely, his lonely silhouette receded into the dark, squally night. The soldiers of the 12th Massachusetts never saw him again. Eventually, they learned of Emerson's fate. A report arrived from Georgia confirming that he had died in Confederate captivity. As it happened, Confederate soldiers captured Emerson on December 4th, three days after uh, he had decided to cook his beans, and he became the first of the inmates to enter Andersonville prison when it opened for business in February 1864. The abnormally hungry Massachusetts soldier did not last two months in that awful prison pen, dying of malnutrition on April 7th. Emerson's comrades had to have known that given his aggressive stomach, no place on earth could have presented him with more suffering than the food-scarce wasteland of Andersonville. Indeed, Emerson's last message to his friends, his prophecy that he would eat his beans in hell if need be, had become reality in the truest possible way. Indeed, he was killed by his beans, I would argue. This concept was not lost on Corporal George Kimball, who remembered the loss of Emerson for the rest of his life. Yet Kimball chose not to focus on Emerson's awful death, but upon the fruitfulness of his sacrifice to his country. 20 years later, Kimball reminded readers, let us hope that what poor Emerson did to bring about a restoration of the Union and a better order of things, and what he suffered in the cause of his country and mankind may weigh in his favor on that great day when God shall judge us for all the deeds we have done in the body. This conclusion was typically optimistic. Despite the many horrible sights Kimball had seen, he always retained his conviction that in the post-war years that all the sacrifice had been for the greater good of the nation. Further, the successful restoration of the Union gave Kimball the authority to imprint a feeling of hope upon the talents of America's future generations. He closed his memoir with these sentimental lines. In withdrawing from the campfire, permit me a personal word. I have made frequent use of the personal pronoun I. This has been with no feeling of self-exaltation. I did no better than the average young American of today would do if like occasion and like opportunity were to present themselves. Nor do I claim that my regiment, the 12th Massachusetts, which I have mentioned so frequently, was any better than any other organizations. All were good, and together they formed one of the grandest armies the world has yet seen. The same tone could not be found in the writings of another Union veteran, Private Henry A. Harmon, 12th New York Cavalry. In 1893, 46-year-old Harmon wrote a four-part series of articles for the National Tribune, a newspaper dedicated to printing war stories submitted by Civil War veterans. Believing that the cruel, dark side of the Civil War had yet to be told, Harmon put his pen to work. In 1864, Harmon had been captured by Confederate soldiers, and he spent the last 11 months in several prisoner of war camps, including Andersonville, the same prison camp in which uh, Emerson had died. Bitter at his treatment, Harmon's memoir amounted to a scathing indictment of the way the war was fought and the depths of human depravity that surrounded him. He was furious at Confederate authorities who persistently mistreated Union inmates. He was frustrated at his own government, which demurred in reopening the prisoner exchange system. And he was displeased by his own comrades who looted the weak and dying for food and shelter. In describing the piled corpses at Andersonville, Andersonville's dead house, Harmon recalled, the number of corpses at the gate each morning increased as the days rolled by. It was a heart-rending sight. The filthy, contorted, shrunken forms wreathed into hideous shapes. Scurvy, by contracting the cords, had drawn the limbs into all manner of positions. Flesh was swollen to bursting, disgusting-looking sores swarmed with lice and maggots, hands were clenched, mouths open, and eyes staring, while swarms of nasty flies filled the air about. The bodies were nearly always naked, as the few rags that had been worn had been stripped from them by someone who had the heart to do it as soon as the breath had left the body, and sometimes before. It was not an unusual sight to see ragged wretches quarreling and fighting over a dying prisoner for the possession of the rags he might have on. Unlike Kimball, Harmon did not close his memoir with any hopeful words for the future. All he remembered was that the Civil War was a never-ending parade of suffering and death. He wrote, no words can express the terrible suffering which hunger and exposure inflicted on the luckless inmates of rebel prisons. Most of them are calloused to all feelings of sympathy or humanity. Death had lost all its sanctity by its frequent occurrence, and not many cared how soon they became its prey. I was finally discharged in June 1865, having served nearly three years. I passed through the war without receiving a wound of any kind, but my health was entirely ruined. 
and my constitution broken by my year's stay with the Rebs. These are among the last lines that Harmon ever wrote. He died in 1893 before the last installment of his serial memoir appeared in print. These two stories remind us of the two visions of the war that veterans imparted to future generations, one effuse with pride and swelled by the memory of heroic accomplishments of the warring sides, whether they be Union or Confederate, the other resentful and transfixed on the awful truth that the war amounted to a never-ending, implacable procession of death. As we stand here on the end of the sesquicentennial commemoration, we must ask ourselves if we gave these men paint and uh, paintbrushes and ordered them to paint the Civil War, what would they show us? I do indeed wonder. Thank you, Dr. Orr. So you should go up because you get applause. <laughs> a lot to consider in what you've just heard in the five panelists, and I'd like to throw something back at them. Um, today we are all very aware of some of the more palatable memoirs by John B. Gordon, Long, James Longstreet, and many of the others, uh, John Bell Hood. The ones that are often referred to over and over again, I'd like to ask for the panel, they can just speak out uh, on their own, uh, who, in your opinion, was the most significant veteran or veterans of the Civil War whose memoirs are still considered to be mandatory reading today, but also how would you reevaluate those memoirs? What we've just heard the past couple of minutes were the realism of war as well as the romanticism of war, and yes, the comedy of war. Who was the most significant veteran's memoir that you can think of offhand, and should we reevaluate that to further understand the history of the Civil War soldier experience and the aftermath. I'll, I'll leave, the, leave the charge here. Um, can everybody hear me okay here? Yeah. All right, great. Now we'll sit down and just talk about this. Um, I'm going to go with U.S. Grant's memoirs. I think um, uh, they're, they're beautifully written. Now he wrote these, of course, as you know, as, at the end of his life as a, as a way to rebuild his fortune after his, finance, uh, his finances had crashed down. Um, and it took him quite a long time. It's a two-volume two uh, set, and I think it's absolutely worth reading. It's a very even-handed account of, of the war. It's a, of, of the military campaigns of the war. Um, very straightforward in his language. And it is, he, he, he gives, he gives uh, props where they're, where they're deserved. He says that the, you know, the Confederates fought a good fight. But, and here's the important but, and we're talking about reevaluation. I think this is very fitting for our times when we're talking about different uh, ways that the war is interpreted now and how we argue about that. What's important about that, uh, about Grant's work, is that he points out that the Confederate cause, though the soldiers fought valiantly, the Confederate cause was the worst cause for which any people ever fought. And of course he was talking about slavery here. And I think it's really important that we look back at this account of the war that is very even-handed and note that even the greatest reconciliationist of them all the man whose campaign slogan was let there be peace, let us have peace, rather. On his tomb in New York, is, uh, there's, there's a, a, a lovely picture of U.S. Grant and Robert E. Lee shaking hands you know, in, in the tomb. He's a reconciliationist by all accounts, yet he still claims, as a reconciliationist, that the Confederate cause was nothing close to noble. So I suggest reading that one, gentlemen. I'll pick up on the race thing. This is kind of is going to go there sooner or later. A very different uh, memoir. Thomas Wentworth Higginson's Army Life in a Black Regiment, I think, should be read more often by students, at least. Um, he commanded the first official black regiment uh, and served in some minor, they saw some combat. It wasn't like 54th Massachusetts or anything like that. But uh, uh, he's a Unitarian minister, an abolitionist. He supported John Brown. He's quite a guy, actually, before the war. Uh, and he sets out to... Um, it's almost an anthropological study of the black soldier. Now, any modern American looking at this is pretty racist, you know, because everyone's racist then. Um, by, and I mean that just as an as a objective term, you know, thinking that African Americans were inferior, um, even if they like them a lot and are very sympathetic. And he is. He's extraordinarily sympathetic. But he thinks there's limitations to their skills, at least as they are currently developed. So you have to kind of take... Well, not kind of. You have to take a lot of the grain of salt. But it's really um, uh, sympathetic. It, it, it makes them into real people, I think. You, it, and, and that's something that most Northerners wouldn't have been able to identify with, you know, because he t names, this is published right after the war. 
Uh, he names names. He has favorite sergeants. He talks about the drummer boys being trouble, as boys are. You know, he humanizes these black soldiers in a way. And they're not heroes because, again, this is the 54th Massachusetts. You know, this is a, a, a regiment that fights some skirmishes, is mainly in guard duty and, uh, and outpost duty. Um, and so it's got uh, some interesting stuff about just daily life in a camp, but also how these mainly former slaves in his regiment um, are adapting to freedom uh, and, and, and how they value their experience in the Army. So I'd throw that one out there. I have a, a number of them that I'm really fond of. One's a, it's actually a collection of letters uh, by Frank Donaldson who's uh, in the 118th Pennsylvania. But um, let me talk about the one I've read most recently. I just finished reading uh, the memoirs of Randolph McKim, who was an aide-de-camp to George Stewart during the Battle of Gettysburg. He fights on Culp's Hill. He's from Maryland, which I think makes him kind of unique as far as the Army of Northern Virginia is concerned. And it, he's kind of like the Forrest Gump of the Battle of uh, Culp's Hill. The guy's everywhere. He's involved in everything. Um, but the great thing about his, um, his memoirs is that, well, first of all, he's super lost cause. Super, super, super lost cause. He's very adamant throughout the entire book that slavery had absolutely nothing to do with, with the war, why he joined the, the Confederate Army, why the men that he fought with were, were fighting. He's very adamant about that. But um, in, his, in his memoirs, from time to time, he uh, will reprint portions of a diary he kept during the campaign, during the battle. And then he also wrote uh, for the Southern Historical Society a paper on, on Stewart's Brigade at the Battle of Gettysburg. He writes the memoir in 1910. The uh, diary is from 1863, perhaps modified, but allegedly from 1863. And then he writes the uh, article that's in the Southern Historical Society papers in, I want to say, 1873. So in this one memoir, he's got kind of two little snapshots, or three little snapshots of his life. He's got McKim in 1910 and what he thinks. He's got McKim in 1873 and what he thinks. And he has McKim boots on the ground, battle campaign, and what he's going through. And um, the, the wonderful thing, I think, about reading through that is here and there you can get little hints at, at how his thoughts changed over time. He's, he's thinking one thing about the battle in 1863 when he's covered in mud and blood on the slopes of Culp's Hill. He remembers it slightly differently in 1910. He paints a slightly rosier picture. Uh, in 1863, after the uh, defeat of the Confederate Army at, at Gettysburg, McKim writes this very dour, depressed letter talking about how their valor will not save them, and how uh, the, only the intervention of God is going to lead to a Confederate victory. And in 1910, he's writing about how oh, Lee wasn't beaten at Gettysburg. His plans were merely foiled, and, and it, you know, it, wasn't, it wasn't a defeat for the Confederate Army. Their morale was unshaken. And uh, it's an incredibly interesting read if you, if you read it kind of holistically. And I think it's out of print, but Google Books may have it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Well, you know, if you have to read one memoir before some interstellar book plague kills all the books, then Keith Harris has it right. It, it's Grant's memoir, uh, not just for his take on uh, reconciliation, but as kind of a memoir that takes you through as much of the war and as many different campaigns and as many different levels of command as possible, Grant's is it. You have to remember he starts out as a colonel in a volunteer regiment from Illinois, uh, he fights in these early campaigns in, in Kentucky and West Tennessee. And he takes you from, from Vicksburg to Chattanooga all the way up to General-in-Chief in command of all the Union forces. And so if you're trying to get a, a grasp on the military situation at all the levels of command from the tactical all the way up to, to the strategic and the problems that commanders have to face, uh, Grant is, is the ideal candidate. Uh, and he, he was such a masterful writer. You know. It, you don't get a sense of, of how much he wrote and how much he loved to write just by looking at the, the book because he wrote this thing, you know, like in a, in a year's time. It is a monster. It is a monster. And, and he was writing like 700 words a day and, and doing it really without much help. He even fired some of his, his aides who had come to his, his assistance when he was writing the thing. Uh, and he just, you know, thought they were kind of getting in the way. So he says, oh, I'm done with you. I'm going to do it all myself. And he, he loved to write. Uh, so Grant's memoir as a, as a piece of literature in Civil War history, I think, is, is ideal. Uh, maybe not, so I don't repeat what others have said. Uh, one other memoir I might suggest is, as a good kind of window into the Civil War, especially the Army of the Potomac, it's a little-known memoir by a guy named Wyman White, uh, who is from New Hampshire. 
And White is interesting because he wrote his memoir based on what he, what he had he, he kept in his diary during the Civil War, but he wrote it uh, many years later uh, after World War I was over. And so it's about as old as a, a Civil War veteran could be to, to write a memoir about his experience. And so it's an interesting take after this one enormous war has ended in which millions of human beings have been exterminated. And to Americans, it was uh, a war that seemed to lead to no greater purpose. Uh, the creation of the League of Nations was, was hopeful, but uh, many Americans were kind of skeptical that it would lead to, to world peace. And of course, it doesn't, as there is another world war um, two decades later. Uh, but in any case, White, uh, his depiction of the Civil War is, is kind of tempered by his old age. Uh, he's far more likely to talk about some of the grittier aspects of being a Civil War soldier. He talks about officers he didn't like. And this is somewhat different from some of the other memoirs you see that are written immediately after the war. And this is kind of a theory that I've often had about veterans when they write that uh, sometimes it takes a long time for veterans to process very horrible events. You know, and uh, one, one example I'll give is this uh, veteran who's very famous from the Normandy invasion in 1944 named Robert Slaughter. He was part of the Company A 116th Infantry, this unit that was like blasted off the face of the earth during the landings on Omaha Beach. In the 1970s, when he was interviewed to give his account, he said very little of what it was like storming Omaha Beach. But in the 1990s, far more vivid in terms of what he said. Uh, all the details that now came bubbling to the surface. And the great question is what had transpired in 20 years uh, to, to make him more, more vocal and more willing to engage with, with horrible <coughs> sights he had seen. And some oral historians believe that it is much easier to get war stories from veterans the closer they approach death. Uh, the, the closer we get to our, our final day makes us more willing to deal with uh, horrific events, uh, things that we haven't processed very well, uh, things that we have repressed, and they come bubbling to the surface in a much more vivid way than they have when we are in our middle ages or even when we are very young, uh, young people. So I think white is kind of reflective of that. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Again, a lot of food for thought. Uh, looking back, as we all study the Civil War, read about the Civil War, it's a matter of the time frame, who's writing the memoir, who's writing the story, but that's what we use to understand the story. The bigger story, of course, might be what's on the battlefield with the monuments, memorials that are out there. Uh, in the time we have left, though, I want to throw this up to the audience. Does anybody have any questions for the panel? And yes, sir, I'll come right to you. Okay, thank you very much for that point. It's a very good point, especially the one you make about northern soldiers is right. I believe that the overwhelming majority of northern soldiers enlisted into the army in 1861 to preserve the Union. Now, as things progressed through the war, as, as, as northern soldiers who had never seen a black person in their life come south and see slavery in action, they begin to change their opinion in some cases. When it becomes apparent that black people were helping the Confederate war effort in various ways, it also becomes important for perhaps maybe to, to attack that institution and do away with it as an effort to win the war again to preserve the Union, right? Uh, th this notion that uh, many Confederates after the war decided that this war wasn't about slavery at all, or if anything, that slavery was only incidental to the war, 
Uh, this is the, something that is, is, I mean, completely delusional from my perspective. In eight, before the war started, everybody was pretty clear on what was going on. Everybody in the South, uh, white people in the South, slave owners and non-slaveholders were pretty clear, at least from their perspective, that what was going on in the North with, with, uh, with, with the Republican Party platform, with abolitionism and all these other things, that sooner or later, should the Republicans take the White House, should the Republicans take the executive and perhaps other branches of the government as well, that they would come South and they would seize that property or try to anyway. That was the perception. It wasn't necessarily the case, but it was the perception. And that was enough to get people excited enough, slaveholders and non-slaveholders alike, to support seceding from the Union in order to protect that institution. Okay? So without that, we have really, really have no war. Now this, after the war, making it not about slavery is a way, like you said, it's to distance their fight and I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that Confederate soldiers didn't fight valiantly for a cause. They most certainly did. But that cause has to be understood as a protection of slavery. Now, they want to distance themselves from that relationship after the fact because it's, it's a case of, you know, uh, not being on the wrong side of history, if you want to put it in those terms. I don't know. But this is a point where the rest of the world has decided that maybe slavery is a bad idea now. And they don't want to be the ones that stand out and say, well, we fought to preserve it. Isn't it too bad we lost because it was a really great thing? Nobody wants to say that in 1880. But thank you for the point. This isn't for anyone in particular, but maybe we can get uh, the panelists different impressions on it. Uh, the conventional wisdom had been that uh, when, when that the veterans came together and and uh, and it was all hugs and kisses after, after the war. Uh, but now we're finding out really that uh, that the veterans kept their sectional. Uh, pride, uh, so to speak, uh, kept their their uh, disagreements as far as the sections alive mo a lot longer than than we had previously thought. I was I was wondering how long or or how how influential were the veterans in uh, reunion? Uh, did 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 a, a significant number of the veterans have to die off before reunion could really be possible or? Or were, were veterans uh, leading the way in reunion, or were, were they just not a factor? I think they might not have been that much of a factor. I think they, in the, in the North at least, they, they came to feel a little left out of things, and they kept pushing for more recognition, I think. Reunion was a political idea, and that happened long before reconciliation might have occurred. So I, I think, and they accepted that. Um, I think. We're kind of talking past some things when we think about this. Um, what obscured, I think, some of the veterans in the North, certainly, feelings about Southerners is that they constantly talked about admiring the bravery of the other side. And that was really their, kind of their public thing quite often, I think. And, and, and I think the public picked up on that. That seemed to be reconciliatory, you know. It doesn't mean you're accepting anything about their, about their um, politics. But the stuff I've done veterans, that's really a huge theme, you know, in, in, uh, when they talk about the other side. They might go on in, in a paragraph or two or, you know, a, a three minutes later in their speech to talk about the cause being corrupt. But they kind of lead with, I think, we have more in common with them than we have with our own countrymen sometimes. So they get really angry about being left out of things and being, in the North, being pension grabbers, you know, and things like that. And so there's some political things going on in the North, at least, that actually kind of pushes them toward reconciliation in a certain way, not this complete unity of cause, but uh, identification with their the former enemy. I think that obscures sometimes the differences. I don't know if that made any sense. You know, Al, what I think is um, happening in a lot of cases is that there's there's two movements going on simultaneously. Sometimes they work together, and sometimes they work in opposition. And there's a whole generation of people who are growing up after the war that did not experience the actual conflict, right? And Having not experienced the conflict, the combat, the, 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 the likelihood of you know, near certain death or, or, or whatever, those people are forming this different kind of national celebration, uh, the people who didn't fight, you know, the politicians who didn't fight. Now, there's plenty of politicians who didn't. You'll see the dialogues between these two people are being, it, it's, it's, it's in conflict often. And so you get uh, events, uh, various commemorative events like World's Fairs and various things like that where uh, none of the issues of war come up at all. It's, it's a very nationalistic, uh, very nationalistic celebration. And they'll make, they might trot out a few Civil War soldiers and they might wave some flags around, but none of the issues really come up. It's when the veterans depart from that experience, when they depart from the 
big scripted flag raising kind of uh, ceremonies. And when they go off into their, and I, I think you have a, 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 a public private kind of thing that mm -hmm. you were mentioning, when they go off into the, the, their, uh, their private GAR uh, built meeting houses and various things like that, or UCV meeting houses, and they talk amongst themselves, or even when they publish stuff that they expect their comrades to read, or when they dedicate monuments on courthouse lawns where they're among friends, then, then they start to bring up some of the more, um, some of the more contentious issues from the war and start pointing, pointing their fingers at their former enemies. Uh, so this is apart from a nationalistic ethos. It's more of a sectional one that are going on at the same time. Let me add something just quickly, and this is probably more anecdotal in nature, about, about the, the kids, the children of Civil War veterans. In 1913, after the 50th reunion, Pennsylvania kind of had an open invitation for these surviving veterans to come back in 1938. And you would think there would be kind of a foregone conclusion that the surviving veterans would want to come back, but apparently that wasn't the case. And his name is escaping me now, but he would go on to become the editor of the Gettysburg Times. But anyways, in 1936, 37, it's basically his job to go to these different, you know, Confederate veteran camps and GAR camps to try to convince these guys to buy into this 1938 reunion. Again, you'd think this would be, you know, easy sell, but apparently it didn't turn out to be the case. And you get the impression, he writes a little book, little pamphlet about about the process of, of taking this idea and turning it into the reunion. He, uh, he writes about the process of going down to Texas. He goes to Jackson, Mississippi, I think. He goes up to Cleveland, I know, talking to these Civil War veterans. And you leave with the impression that it was a much bigger challenge to convince the sons of Confederate veterans and the sons of Union veterans to buy into this, this reunion at Gettysburg than it necessarily was for the the veterans themselves. And again, I don't know if that's anecdotal or not, but I found it interesting when I was reading it. Okay. Uh, any further questions from anybody? Can't believe it's way silent. In the back, way in the back. Way, 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 way in the back. back. Way, way in the back. Well, as far as Reconstruction goes, I think it's a little extreme to say it's either a success or a failure. It's sort of, you know, some things are completed. Uh, the federal government's goals for Reconstruction, others are not. Um, and the most famous historian of Reconstruction is uh, Eric Boner, and he kind of defines it as an incomplete revolution, as a, uh, a massive change in uh, the way the federal government relates to its citizens and that this revolution in uh, citizenship is just sort of incomplete, and it's not really comes full swing until you get to the civil rights era of the 20th century. Uh, you know, as far as reconciliation goes, uh, it's a much tougher thing to kind of define. Uh, you're trying to ask, at what point do, does, uh, do people start to reconsider their national identity over their regional identity? Uh, and, and that's uh, something you could write books endlessly on. Uh, but uh, a fascinating question. And it really does depend that the government is reunited. The, the United States functions. It comes together and does what a government does. You know? And so from a purely political standpoint, one supposes it's a success. I think reconciliation depends on the audience, depends on the person, depends on, I mean, um, I think James Tanner thought it was a great success. You know. Um, but many others did not. But he was also a really leader in raising funds for Confederate veterans. He actually acted out his reconciliationist ideas. Um, obviously, the African American community wouldn't have thought it was much of a success uh, in, in many different ways. And the GAR, well, I think, while privately they were actually much more uh, enthusiastic about African American uh, experience, uh, contributions and so forth within the GAR, they're not very public about that part of it. They just give speeches and so forth. But they don't. They're not like they're, they're out there fighting hard for equal rights for African Americans in the 1880s. They comment on it, perhaps, but they're not really promoting it. 
I think reconciliation is a success for individuals, probably not for the country as such, except as a political process. I think that's a pretty good way of putting it, actually. I mean, uh, one thing we have to make sure that we always do is to separate the notion of reunion and reconciliation. Those two things are often used interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. Reunion is a political thing, as mm -hmm. you mentioned. That's the coming together of formerly warring parties. That was the point of the Union War effort, to bring about reunion. That was successful. Reconciliation is another thing altogether. Now, I think the best way to get to whether or not it's uh, success is to, well, we can't actually ask them, but we can read the reports of the people who fought in the war. Now, a lot of these guys said, that, yes, indeed, we are reconciled. So if you, use, if you look at that <laughs> language, then you can say, well, sure, they thought they were reconciled. But then when you understand, and I guess definition is really, um, is really uh, what's on the chopping block here, uh, how are they defining reconciliation? And that's the real question that you have to get to, I think. To be reconciled doesn't mean to agree with something. I mean, we use it that yeah. way. Yes, I'm reconciled I know. with that. Okay. <laughs> um, exactly my point. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, in the very far back, sir, if you could stand up in the back row. Yeah, you already asked them about who would we go back and look at again for the benefit of time. Is there anyone who maybe could have written something who either didn't <laughs> or was or died before they had a chance to, who maybe had given some speeches, you're talking about Tanner, giving talks, was there anyone that maybe didn't write down things that they talked about so we don't have the benefit of having a written history. Is there anybody like that? Yeah, I'd love to read Joe Hooker's memoirs, just a pure <laughs> enjoyment of it. <laughs> but it, it, that's true. I mean, Joe Hooker doesn't write a lot about, about the war, doesn't write a lot afterwards. He has a relatively short time, uh, relatively short lifespan after the war. And man, if I, if I had one guy I could resurrect and say, hey, write a little bit, it'd probably be Joe Hooker. Um, I would say Robert E. Lee, of all people, yeah, you know? Yeah. Like, um, I always try to point out to my students, you know, you know, I, I asked him the question, well, why did Lee invade Pennsylvania? And it, it's, it's all a guessing game because you believe it, like the, one of the most famous generals in U.S. military history, uh, in one of the most famous battles in North American history, we don't really know why, why he actually wanted to invade. We have to read into his, his after-action report over and over again. And there are nevertheless countless books out on, you know, Lee's real plan at Gettysburg, you know, to tell us what, what we think he was doing. And if he had a memoir that said, this is going through my mind at this exact point, we would know. We, we would be, have it all figured out. But um, uh, I guess I, I would say, yeah, I'd like to see what, what, what Lee would have written if had he the moment, you know, to, to sit down and write it. Along those lines, I would love to know what Lincoln would I was just going to say that. The war. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking about one major figure whose, whose fingerprints are all over those, those four years of conflict, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, someone refilled this. Thank you. I guess Karen says that I have such a big mouth I don't need a mic, but that's why I don't have to yell. Thank you. Someone filled me in today, and of course we basically knew this anyway, but I'm interested in knowing from you four, uh, General Lee's objective for Gettysburg was of course to take Gettysburg and take over D.C. because he was well aware that, that uh, Grant was doing very well in the West. Do you think that his objective was, this is my last shot at winning the war. I have, if I get D.C., then it's over with? Or do you think it's more to it than that? I don't think Washington, D.C. really figured into his plans at all. I don't even really think he cared about Harrisburg. I think what Robert E. Lee cares about is the Union Army. He's going to Pennsylvania with the hopes that the Union Army will follow him into a northern state. He hopes to fight that army and crush it and defeat it. Uh, Robert E. Lee's goal during the Gettysburg Campaign is to destroy the Union Army. It's as simple as that. Look what he does on June 28th when he learns that the Union Army is in Frederick, uh, relatively close. At that point in time, his troops are literally on the doorstep of Harrisburg, capital of the state. And the one thing he does is he stops, he turns around, he gathers his army, and then the battle happens. Look what he does on July 1st. Look what he does on July 2nd. He continues the battle at Gettysburg. He doesn't have to. He can withdraw. He can, he can try to outmaneuver the Union Army. His objective is the Union Army. It's the thing he wants to kill the most, and at Gettysburg is right in front of him. Washington, D.C. was the most fortified city in the world at that time. And I think even with the, the heroism and the leadership of the Army of Northern Virginia and their, their sky-high morale at that point, I think it would have been highly unlikely 
that Lee would ever have been able to capture Washington, D.C., never mind hold it. And you know something else, uh, Lee was very, very clear on the connections between the battlefield and the home front. Now, if he then wanted to, he did, if, even if he didn't want to actually physically capture Washington, D.C., nobody really knew that. And if he threatened it, or if he maneuvered around in Pennsylvania long enough, he knew that everybody on the home front read the papers. And if he could do that on northern soil, if he could you know, sap the morale of the northern uh, populace enough to make them not support the war, that could have been very beneficial for him as well. It, one of the things you'll see from this discussion, this is the way we try to understand Lee's objective uh, during the Pennsylvania campaign, is we have to kind of deduce it by his actions. And sort of the way Chris dealt with it is exactly the way historians deal with it. Well, this is what he does. So this is what we must conclude is uh, his, his, uh, his plan. Uh, there's only basically one letter that he writes that has any indication as to, to what he is attempting to achieve. And, uh, it's basically what Keith alluded to, this letter he writes to the Secretary of War, I think June 9th uh, of thereabouts, and he tries to make this, this connection that it will, that a, a campaign in Pennsylvania will have a political outcome in the North, that it will, it will reinforce the Confederates' friends in the North. But that is the only thing that you can go to that historians can say is conclusive proof what Lee writes down. Uh, with us validating my belief that we, I really wish we had a Lee memoir because it would, it would, it would uh, totally resolve these mysteries. Because beyond that, it's basically kind of deducing the Gettysburg campaign by the actions of the senior most Confederate general. Uh, we have very little writing uh, that helps us out. In listening to you talk today, a thought kind of occurred to me that there's sort of a slip on both sides in terms of memory, and that as you pointed out, that for the North, the war was about preserving the Union, and for the South, it's about slavery. But when I was growing up, you know, when, when you're in elementary school and you learn about the war, you really hear more about it in terms of it's the war that ended slavery. And those in the North, I suppose, were willing to let the fact that it was really not so much about ending slavery as preserving the Union slipped to a little nobler cause on slavery. And there in the South, because slavery again is, not, there's nothing to defend there on moral grounds, um, it slipped into other causes, our, our heritage, preserving our heritage. The, the yeoman farmer who owned no slaves who was fighting back an invader. And besides all that, the kind of irony, because this is a civil war, say, unlike World War II, where we don't talk about the honor and the valor of soldiers who were fighting under the Axis and memorialize what they did, even though they were defending their, for their homelands and believed in their cause. And whereas here we did that with the Civil War for specific purpose, and I just think it's kind of interesting to look at it through that lens. And that's my comment. Well, you know, I think it's really, um, there's national policy and there's individual motivation, and we tend to conflate them. I think many Confederate soldiers could say the straight face they weren't fighting to preserve slavery, but they knew, they knew full well that their government was. Um, they don't have to say that they're, they're going to, their immediate motivation is to do something else, but it's wrapped up with the larger policy of their government. Even northern soldiers who wouldn't have put slavery as their primary thing come to be reconciled with the idea that it's become a war against slavery. Uh, it doesn't mean they're really enthusiastic about it all the time, but they, they realize it become, has become national policy. It might not be what they sign up for, it not, might not be what they are still fighting for, was part of the larger issue that um, that, that sort of is a, includes theirs as well, I think. So I think we do tend to get caught up in motivation in, as individuals versus national policy, which of course is why the war takes place in the first place. Can I just say something really quickly about, um, and, and thanks for your comment, something really quickly about Northerners, uh, Union veterans commemorating uh, after the fact. Uh, this, this notion of that they fought to preserve the Union was always <coughs> paramount uh, between 61 and 65, and it was so also during the commemorative efforts in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, and into the 20th century. 
but they but during the the latter third of the 19th century this this sort of moralizing self-righteousness swept across uh, Union veterans and they and they latched on to this idea that they actually not only did they preserve the Union but they also ended slavery and this became an equal to preserving the Union after the war and you'll notice uh, on it does not any, I don't really see any monuments about ending slavery here at Gettysburg, but you'll see them all over the place. There's a gi there's the twin gigantic twin pillars in Philadelphia that uh, one of them says freedom and the other one says union on it, and you can't miss this fact. You know, and, and <coughs> in the last 20 years, there's been plenty of plenty of people, plenty of scholars who have said that no, union veterans never talked about this kind of thing. When of course they did, they did so all of the time. Let me piggyback on Dr. Harris's comment for a second. Uh, he's right, there are no monuments out on this battlefield that even allude to the ending of slavery, uh, as that being one of the accomplishments of the Union veterans who returned to the battlefield. That being said, uh, I encourage you to go and read the dedicatory remarks that these veterans uh, recited, spoke when they were dedicating their veterans. Time and time again, they allude to the ending of slavery as one of the accomplishments of the Battle of Gettysburg. They, uh, it's making a sweeping generalization, but they very clearly connect their Union victory at Gettysburg with the destruction of slavery, time and time again. There's one, um, one uh, dedication that takes place over on East Cavalry Field, and the, uh, the gentleman giving the dedica dedicatory remarks points to a spot on the battlefield where at one point they had um, dug temporary graves for some of the men that had been killed, and he said, quote, there too we buried the shackles of the slaves. You'll find that time and time again in these dedicatory remarks of, of Union regimental monuments on the battlefield. Specifically, the New Jersey monuments, the yep. 8th and the 12th, I believe. If you can read those, they're published and available. I believe it still is in print. Um, and you, you can, it, 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 and, and like you said, it's just over and over and over again they talk about slavery. On behalf of the Gaysburg Foundation and Gaysburg National Military Park, I want to thank our distinguished panel for coming tonight. <laughs> Wonderful discussion. <laughs>